Hi, everyone. I'm sure people are starting to trickle in here to our masterclass tonight. Welcome, everyone. I'll be moderating, and we have our three other rock star guests on the screen as well. So thanks so much for joining us. As a quick way to get us started, I um, would love for you to type in the chat box where you're calling in from tonight and what adventure you're most excited about this summer. Where is that most excited adventure going to take place for you? So where are you calling in from and where are you planning to adventure this summer? Drop those in the chat, get some things rolling as everyone trickles in. Nice, we've got some California, some Seattle, Texas. I love it, all over the place. LA. Nice, we've got an off-roader joining us today. It's super good. So I'm gonna roll through some reminders as people hop on. Um, you should be good to go with your video and your audio. They should be turned off for you, so no worries on that. Um, if you suspect you might have any Zoom streaming issues, you can always close other tabs and give Zoom the, the full, full scope here for best experience. Um, also check out the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen bar and put any questions in there. We will be plucking a few of those out throughout the evening um, to kind of insert into our programming this eve. So drop any Q&A that you have into that, um, into that Q&A bar. Don't put them in the chat, they might get lost. Um, another fun thing to know, we have an incredible customer service team. Um, so if you have any questions about your personal account, how to use our app, um, you need some troubleshooting, email help at onyxmaps.com. Um, don't put those questions in the chat. If you have a personal question, they might get lost in there too, but direct shot to our awesome customer service team, um, help at onyxmaps.com, and they will hook you up with a fast answer and support. Um, we will be doing a giveaway near the end of this hour. So don't disappear early, stay tuned. We have an icon pass to give to one lucky winner, uh, which is super exciting. So stay tuned for that. Um, another thing to stay tuned for is a survey, which we will kick out to all of you attendees tomorrow via email. Um, these master classes are a fairly new series for us here at Onyx and our hunt team is doing them backcountry and off-road and we want to make sure we're giving you the best experience, the, the, get the best people we can um, to join us for these. So we'd love your feedback, your ideas of how to, how to do these better and better. So keep your eye out for that survey. We would love your answers on that. Um, and I see a lot of people coming in, which is amazing. Um, anyone that just popped in in the last minute or two in the chat, we would love for you to place in there where you're calling in from tonight. And I'm going to switch up our question a little bit. Um, what is your big objective for the summer as far as an outdoor adventure goes? What is your big objective? Um, Onyx Backcountry is such a great tool for figuring out those uh, those all the routes and where can you go and throw the map in 3D. There's just so much to it that can really help you dial in and feel super prepared and confident um, in those objectives, big or small. So we want to hear about them. Where are you headed? And one last note before we kick us off. Um, if you are watching this video sometime after today, if it's not live, the Q&A will not be interactive and the giveaway will be closed. So just a note on that. Um, if you're watching later on, a um, couple things to note. And with that, I'm going to kick us going here into our next slide. So first, a little round of introductions. So who am I? I am Becky Marcelliano, the Senior Access and Stewardship Marketing Manager for Onyx. Um, my love of the outdoors started on the East Coast in the hills of New Jersey, uh, but bigger mountains very much drew me west, probably like many of you. Um, and that's where I've spent the last two decades of my life in Colorado and Utah doing a multitude of things, including teaching environmental ed, uh, guiding wilderness travel trips, managing marketing teams for various outdoor brands. Um, and I'm really driven by human connection, our wild places, and purpose-driven initiatives. So 
you can find me outside doing a lot of things, nothing all that well. I'm a jack of all trades, master of none, but love to be out there um, in my truck, riding down dirt roads or fishing, um, hiking, backpacking, mountain biking, uh, you name it. And so I'm really passionate about access and stewardship and thrilled to be here with our amazing guests tonight to have this chat with you all. So thanks for joining us. And next up, I'm going to introduce Caroline Gleick, who is an Onyx backcountry ambassador, ski mountaineer, and climbing activist. Um, Caroline, give us a little intro and maybe share a couple of your favorite accomplishments. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. And my name is Caroline Gleick. I'm a professional ski mountaineer and climate activist from Park City, Utah. I originally, I grew up, I was born and raised in Minnesota. And ever since I was a little girl, I had the dream of climbing and skiing the world's biggest mountains. Maybe it's because I'm really short, but I just wanted to see what the world looked like from the tops of the mountain peaks. And so in 2017, I became the first woman and the fourth person to climb and ski all 90 lines in the shooting gallery, which is a steep skiing guidebook to my home mountain range in Utah, the Wasatch. And then I went on to take my skills to some of the biggest mountains in the world. In 2018, I climbed and skied Cho Oyu, which is the sixth highest peak in the world. And in 2019, I climbed Mount Everest. And um, in just a couple of days, my partner and I are embarking on another adventure to go climb and ski Gasher Brum 2, which is the 13th highest peak in the world in the Karakoram Mountains of Pakistan. Along the way, um, advocacy activism has been a really big part of my platform. I've testified to, the, to Congress, to the Senate and the House about how climate is affecting um, snow sports and advocating for protecting more public land as, clim as a climate solution. So I'm really excited to share with you some of the lessons that I've learned along the way about community organizing. Awesome, thanks, Caroline. And now over to Kristen Norman, who is a She Jumps volunteer, snowpack scholarship manager and co-founder and ski mountain bike and climb athlete. Kristen, tell us a little bit more about you. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Kristen, uh, she, her, and I'm actually a fermentation and coffee scientist as my day job. Um, as volunteer work for the past seven years, I've been volunteering with She Jumps, which is a nonprofit that's committed to getting women and girls outside and providing access to outdoor sports for them. Um, I founded the Snowpack Avalanche and Icon Pass Scholarship back in 2017. And over the past few years, we've actually provided um, over 170 ARI uh, level one and level two avalanche safety training certifications to women and women of color across, um, I think it's actually eight states now. And we've also provided 33 icon passes along with ski gear for BIPOC women um, all over the US, which has been really cool. It's been a really neat project. Um, a big focus of mine has just been to provide access to underrepresented individuals, especially women and women of color, and to encourage high-level instruction, formal certification, and just coordinating any stewardship efforts I can, especially at my local trails. So um, my main sports are skiing, climbing, and mountain biking. Um, and I really wanted to focus on giving back to each of these communities with uh, the participation that I do in the sports and just seeing an increase in usership over the years and wanting to make sure that we can leave all of our trails sustainable for the future. Massive kudos, Kristen. This is not easy work and you're doing it and doing it really well. So really glad to have you here tonight. Yeah, thank you. And last but not least, Dean Ronzoni of Leave No Trace. Uh, Dean is a legend at Leave No Trace. He's been there for so many years and um, is very much an environmental education um, expert and has been really instrumental throughout the years in building Leave No Trace's programming. Um, and work that they do across lots of different programs and, and off offers that they that they have to help educate people about what to do out there um, and the best ways to prolong the health of our trails. So Dean, take it away. Yeah, I'm super excited to be on this panel with everyone here. Really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, like Becky said, and thank you, Becky, that was pretty amazing to hear. Um, I have been at Leave No Trace for a long time. I've been there actually for 12 years, I'm the Director of Corporate Partnerships 
And that means I get to work with all different types of corporations, large and small, even business startups that are interested in using leave no trace principles to communicate and connect to their end users and create um, amazing different types of programs like we're doing with the Great Outdoors Month with Onyx this month. Um, I get to work personally on that program, be on this panel, um, help communicate our hotspots program to Onyx users and beyond. So very excited to be here. Um, this is actually a photo of my backyard. I live in Boulder, Colorado, and pretty much every week, a couple of buddies and I go up and make coffee every morning and watch the sunrise. So this is kind of one of my favorite places to be, um, and I'm excited to be here today. You're making me miss Boulder, Dean. I lived in Boulder for almost 20 years and know that spot well. So uh, yeah, what a good, good flashback. Um, okay, so what's on the docket from here on out? So first, I'm going to give you a few fun facts about Onyx's access and stewardship initiatives and our history with this important work. Then we're going to go through a celebratory case study from each of these three rock stars to highlight the types of purpose-driven projects that you can mobilize around um, and, and really listen in about how they each found success in that. After that, we'll open up the discussion um, with the four of us to dive into a few other deep dive topics um, about the hows and what's rallying others and then giving back to our trails through cleanup efforts. And then we'll have some time for Q and A, we'll have some grant announcements, giveaway information and resources at the end. So we've got a stacked 50 minutes left um, so let's get into it. Okay, before we do a little Onyx backcountry plug here, if you are not a paying user yet, um, now is an incredible time to join. You get a discount um, and then Onyx will donate $10 back to leave no trace. So it's really a win-win. It's a great way for us all to kind of give back to each other. Um, so as a masterclass um, access here, you can, you can purchase at 20% off. You can also uh, just start your 14 day trial using this QR code to at least get you into the app. You can poke around um, and then think about your purchase after that. So just a little plug there about a special deal and discount. And I think it's really important to give a little history here about um, Onyx, where we began and, and what's most important to us as far as access and stewardship. So maybe you guys know, maybe you don't. Onyx was founded actually for the Hunt consumer. Our Hunt app was the first one. And our founder, Eric Siegfried, really installed um, access as a key pillar of the brand from day one of launching Onyx. Um, alongside really wanting to be the best in class digital navigation that Onyx is, he also wanted to support access initiatives through three key pillars that you see here on the slide. We really wanted to be experts in data reporting. We wanted to collaborate with all the right people and projects, um, land managers and so on to do the work, boots on the ground in the places that we necessarily couldn't go, but we wanted to work with them through collaboration. And then we also wanted to contribute. We have a lot of philanthropic um, goals and um, projects that we do at Onyx across all three of our verticals. So we wanted to make sure we were a really strong contributor to access projects. And because our product is so data-driven, this truly has enabled us over time to provide value in collaboration with land managers, with policymakers, and the public to identify access challenges that are out there and work towards various solutions over the years. One of the things that we have is a cross-vertical grant program. Um, and the goals here are by 2023, we hope to help secure or improve public access to 150,000 acres of land and to help restore, secure, or build 150 trail miles. Um, so you can see these little charts on the screen, and I think this is actually a bit outdated at this point, but you can see we're trucking along, still some work to do with this grant program, truly allows us to fund projects out there and work with various landowners, um, land managers, and projects to, to make sure that we're getting uh, our acres and miles uh, supported and maintained and cared for. Uh, for recreational purposes. Um, at Onyx, our mission is to awaken the adventurer in everyone. That's the tagline that we also fa always fall back to. And we believe that everyone has a right to experience nature and outdoor recreation, whatever that looks like to them. Um, but there's a lot of barriers to getting outside. We know that. 
Um, and that can be land management issues, inequalities, the cost of gear and transportation. And sometimes in some places and communities, it can simply mean a lack of green space. So while there's all these barriers, we also know that more and more people are getting outside um, a lot thanks to COVID. This is no surprise to anyone, um, but we know then even more so than ever that stewardship of our land is uh, more critical than ever and that we as a brand have a duty to promote stewardship and support access to outdoor recreation. So that is a very high level history of, of Onyx on these topics. Um, you can really dive in into some, some neat reports that we have launched, but hopefully just a, a bit of fun facts there to share. Okay, so we're gonna dive into our celebratory case studies. Um, Kristen, I'm gonna turn it over to you to share your success stories of how She Jumps has really mobilized and supported underrepresented groups in the outdoors. And I'd love to, for you to tell us like how you really launched this programming that truly is creating change. Yeah, so when I first started volunteering with She Jumps, um, my role that I signed on as was an ambassador at the time that sort of meant just um, event coordination. And so what I was doing uh, at the time I lived in Seattle, which I live just outside of Seattle now, um, a lot of what I was focusing on was putting on events to bring women together to meet partners to go recreate with. Um, as I spent more time doing these events, I really saw a need for lowering the actual barrier to physically accessing these outdoor sports. I met women who didn't have avalanche education, who wanted to go backcountry skiing, who couldn't afford the gear that they needed to recreate safely in the backcountry. And they were just relying on, say, um, their partners or friends to get them through safely and decision make for them. Um, so in terms of stewardship, I see a couple things. There's the physical access to trails, but then there's also the access to education to make good decisions and also access to gear to be able to protect yourself to. Um, so that's where I saw the need to found something like the Snowpack um, Avalanche Scholarship Program, which at the time um, I ended up working with um, the She Jumps Washington Regional Coordinator, who's a good friend of mine, her name is Yulia. And so she really helped me to bring this together along with the Northwest Avalanche Center, who's our local nonprofit that's focused on avalanche safety in the Washington and Oregon areas. Um, and so for this program, we really focused on bringing um, opportunities for underrepresented individuals and those who can't actually afford education or certification courses to be able to access area courses. So we started with area level one courses and have expanded from providing scholarships in Washington State and Oregon, which is sort of our like home base where we founded this program. Um, since we've expanded to Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, California, and then also um, in New England and New Hampshire um, to put on ARI courses. And for all of these, they've been completely paid for. So the women who are taking the courses are able to access um, an ARI course free of cost, which is really awesome. And then they're also showing up and being taught by women for women. Um, so their entire course is women identifying and has a female lead instructor as well. Um, so that's been a really neat opportunity to see grow. And there's been a lot of interest in expanding this to different parts of snow sports. Um, and so we've also expanded with Icon Pass to providing Icon Passes and also ski gear over the years. And so this has been just a really neat way to see snow sports open up to more people. Um, so the, the She Jumps Snowpack Scholarship Program is definitely something that has been like a passion project of mine and the people who have been involved in helping expand it to different regions. Um, and I think a big thing for this is just that, that idea of stewardship in the sense of giving back to your communities to provide people with safety and the education that they need to actually access the sports in a safe way and recreate. So some of the other types of stewardship events that I've worked on with She Jumps is actually organizing um, just community trail stewardship events. So a little more into like the physical access to maintaining trails or trailheads or just making um, access to recreation easier. 
Um, so as we are actually increasing usership, um, say to climbing, like rock climbing destinations, or um, for me, mountain biking is a sport that I participate in. The trail is so important to mountain biking and hiking. And it's something that I see um, stewardship efforts for these sports are a lot better than say rock climbing, whereas rock climbing stewardship efforts for trails aren't quite as common just because climbers care more about the route than they do about the trail. And so one of the first trail stewardship events that I helped organize was actually focused on maintaining some of the the trails in Leavenworth, Washington. Um, so I don't know if any of you have climbed in Leavenworth, but a lot of the climbers trails approaches are basically just like a steep hill that you like walk up and there's a climbers trail, which is basically uh, an undeveloped trail that is prone to erosion and hasn't been um, properly created for access to a climbing area. And so uh, working with different organizations such as She Jumps, um, but organizing trail trail days with Access Fund. Um, there's also a bunch of other nonprofits, um, the Washington Climbers Coalition and Washington Trails Association. These organizations have a lot of um, good contacts for actually accessing land properly, so that when you're you're going to do trail work, you can first of all have the right tools to, to do trail work and then also can make sure that you're accessing land properly and getting proper land usage rights um, from locals or natives in the area. Um, and so doing um, one of my first she jumps stewardship events um, focused on cl clamshell caves in Leavenworth. Um, and this is a partnership that really helps focus on maintaining um, a trail that had a ton of erosion in the steep parts from overuse. And it was sort of like right at the end of winter getting into the spring climbing season. Um, and let's see. So another option for climbing stewardship is actually doing panels. So instead of doing just like a physical trail work day, you could also host a panel that gets people talking about different stewardship opportunities. Um, and so there's another type of event that I've done, and it, it was just hosting a panel at the local Arcteric store in Seattle. Um, and this focused on bringing in Access Fund, American Alpine Club, Washington, Cl Washington Climbers Coalition, and also Washington Trails Association to talk about just ways to actively um, or locally activate through access issues. Um, and talk about ways to actually get trail work to get anchor or bolt replacement happening in climbing areas and then also teaching gym to crag etiquette. Um, and then moving into mountain bike trails, um, a lot of trails are maintained by local mountain bike associations. Um, so in Washington, we have Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance, which is our kind of our main trail building, building association. And so a lot of the trail work that they're doing, they're hosting dig parties or trail work days where you can actually volunteer your time. Um, a lot of these are already set up with different groups. Um, there might be like riding groups who wanna partner with local nonprofits to actually do trail work. So that's another great way to kind of get involved with trail work in the first place. Um, but another way to do it is if you reach out to your local nonprofits, maybe there are certain trails that you use where you've seen need to actually plan for preventing erosion in the future, or you've seen draining, drainage issues. Um, and so I've done a little bit of work with, um, first of all, my local pump track in North Bend to maintain the pump track there, which is, it's sort of like a smaller trailhead in a way. It's, um, it's kind of like a small bike park. Um, and that one is actually used a lot by like small children um, and just like teenagers who may, might not have access to like a more expensive full suspension mountain bike, but they might have like a push bike or learning how to bike. Um, and so I've done a couple of trail dig days with Evergreen Mountain Bike Lines and just like the park service there to actually maintain the trails. Um, a big focus on trail work for mountain biking is really just preventing erosion from drainage issues. Um, also just working on maintaining over usage and mitigating that. Um, and 
typically, if you work with an, an organization that is already doing the trail building in the area, they'll have all the right tools and trail builders who can teach you all about how to do proper trail maintenance. Um, another type of trail day that I organized was actually more women focused, where um, we actually brought together key folks from the women's community in mountain biking in the Seattle area and did a dig day where we actually um, focused on preparing a specific trail for the winter and the rain load here in Washington. So we got together in October to prevent erosion. Um, there's actually also an enduro race that happened maybe a week before. Um, so we actually got together and um, some of the pictures actually in this are from that day from Ann Cleary. Uh, but we called it the whole shebang and we just brought a bunch of women in the bike community together to kind of talk about how we can further women's mountain biking, but also got out and dug together. We we had some folks who are uh, from Evergreen Mountain Bike Lines who came out and taught us how to use the tools properly. Um, and again, our big focus was really just preventing um, erosion from drainage uh, and just mitigating any of the overuse areas that had been um, kind of damaged from lots of riding. Um, and I think a big thing with all of these community and stewardship events that I want to make sure to touch base on is that as we recreate and use each of these spaces and participate in sports outdoors, it's really our responsibility to contribute to maintaining the spaces. So I think it's really important if you want to get into a sport or if you are a heavy user, it's really important to volu volunteer your time back to actually make the whole experience of that outdoor sport sustainable and really awesome for future generations and that we can continue doing these sports in our own lifetime, making sure that we're not taking more than we're giving. That's so well said, thanks Kristen. Thanks. Yeah, and I mean, gosh, you've done so many things, which is so incredibly impressive. And I think like what a, what a great takeaway for the crowd here listening in who is maybe thinking about how they can give back to their community, like depending on the sport or the needs or the community or the trail uh, situation, like you have to really think about what the project needs, what that type of athlete or adventurer needs, and then build out your action plan from there. Because um, yeah, a backcountry ski day looks very different than a mountain bike day, right? So what a cool mm -hmm. takeaway to just kind of think about what is truly needed here for the purpose at hand. Yeah, I think an uh, important thing is just being able to discuss things with your community and always having an open conversation. Um, but I really love throwing ideas around with nonprofit folks that I meet because they always have the tools and resources to be able to actually like make stuff happen. Um, and that's been like a really cool learning experience over the years. I love that. Okay, Caroline, we're gonna kick it over to you. Um, to share with us a little bit about the incredibly powerful climate rally that you organized back in 2020. Um, I was there to see it. It truly was a force. It was so neat. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what it took to rally a community around climate advocacy? Yes, yes. Um, and Kristen, thank you so much for sharing all of your experience and thank you for all the great work you've done. That was amazing to hear about. So when I started my journey as an activist, I really didn't know where to start, but I had like a lot of powerful emotions behind it. Like at times I felt depressed or anxious or like this overwhelming hopelessness. And um, there's this Yvonne Chouinard quote that really stuck with me. And it was, I found the cure for depression is action. And so that's really been kind of a guiding force for mobile, like turning those emotions that we start with into something positive. So like when I was in college, I was really concerned about plastic pollution. So I would spend some afternoons on the beach collecting trash and making art out of it, trying to sell it at a local flea market. And that is, that was a fun, it was a fun thing to do, but it also felt like, you know, there's always more plastic trash coming. And so it felt a little bit overwhelming. So it started to help me see that do those things, do the cleanups. And if you can advocate for change in the systems, in these broader systems, like, like working to hold the corporations that are making all this plastic 
holding them accountable and holding the governments accountable for tolerating all of this plastic that's being made. And I just wanted to say, like, I know a lot of people here listening are very outdoorsy. And so it takes all these same skills that we have for outdoor adventure to become an activist. It's planning, preparing, research, connecting with community, mentorship, sometimes taking a class, joining a group. Um, and I just really want to take a moment to encourage us to move away from shaming others, especially those people that are also outdoor lovers. Because as an activist, like I've seen a lot of this finger pointing and this knee jerk reaction where people are yelling at each other. And it's really like people that we should be mobilizing together with. So the more that we can like go away from shaming and policing and finger pointing to mobilizing and unifying for targeted strategic actions that unify us. I, I really want to just take a moment to, to say that that's kind of how we should be thinking about it. So now going to this climate rally, um, like one of the things that I became increasingly concerned about is how can we protect our wild places from the mass destruction of the climate crisis? Wildfires, fl flooding, these glaciers melting, um, and how can public lands become part of climate solutions? And so I've spent a lot of time learning about different kinds of land designations and Onyx Backcountry is a great tool actually for figuring what kind of land you're on and how to protect it. Cause there's a lot of different kinds of public lands. But um, as I became more focused as an activist, I found my voice on protecting public lands from fossil fuel extraction. And so in 2020, I was very inspired by the youth activist movement and their strikes on Fridays. You know, they started by Greta Thunberg and other youth activists around the world. They would strike and leave school on Fridays to advocate for climate action. And so when I saw that the outdoor retailer and snow sports trade show was going to be in Denver on a Friday, I was like, we need to mobilize and we need to make a statement because really the future of the outdoor community depends on climate action. And so I just like had this idea and I went online and I got a permit to have a rally. I talked to a friend to see if she'd help me organize. That is a real big key, I think, to being a good, effective activist, whether it's doing a cleanup or organizing a climate rally, is like having a buddy that you can call up and do this stuff with. Like that always helps me hold myself accountable. And it also makes it more fun. And so we got the permit. Um, we started making an event, like we used Eventbrite and Facebook, and we started making phone calls. And as we got like going with it, we started to really work with local leaders, indigenous leaders, you know, the youth leaders and people in frontline communities who are most affected by the climate crisis. You know, the people who suffer higher rates of asthma or disproportionate rates of public health crises because of air quality issues related to fossil fuel extraction or burning. And we decided like with the Speak Year series that we really wanted to highlight their leadership. So I learned a lot from listening, especially to some of the indigenous people that we worked with. Um, and we made signs, we had the speaker list and hundreds of people showed up and we marched. And I think one of the most powerful ways to take that feeling of depression or anxiety or whatever it is that you're starting from and turn it into action is to exercise your constitutional right to peaceably assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances that is in the constitution. And there's just something so powerful about taking to the streets and marching. So um, it was super cool just to go from this little baby of an idea I had in my mind to seeing hundreds of people marching down the streets of Denver. And I think that's what I just really want to encourage all of you to do with your activism as well is to mobilize in a way that unites us and makes us stronger rather than shaming each other or pointing fingers or yelling at each other. And so working with local nonprofits, like that's a really powerful way to get involved and to think about how we can create the infrastructure to keep our trailheads and trails clean. And to think about it also like at the policy level of like, how can we get more funding 
for infrastructure like signage or trailhead services and other things to make it easier for people to leave no trace. And so, yes, I'm excited to hear from Dean and to also answer any questions. Thanks, Caroline. That was awesome. Um, I'm sure so much work went into that and so much passion and uh, it really was neat to see out there. And I just, I love your ability to, to rally people because of who you are and people just love you and they want to, to, to rally behind you as an athlete and an activist and, and they trust you to, to lead the charge, um, but also, also to have such great um, policy knowledge of like, how do we truly take action on a bigger scale, I think is such a critical balance in all of this and, and you really excel at that balance. So um, thanks for sharing all of that. Okay, Dean, um, over to you. Leave No Trace has been a cleanup powerhouse for many decades. Uh, Dean, can you please tell us about a specific project that was a success for you and Leave No Trace and what it took to organize the community around um, your cleanup cause? And then let me know when you want me to click over to the maps. Yeah, thanks, Becky. Um, Caroline, that was really cool to hear. I definitely saw the climate rally you don't really think about how much work goes into these things. So it was really cool to hear coming from just a conceptual idea to something so big that you just kind of see throughout the entire outdoor retailer show and until it happens, then it blows up on social media and you see it for the next couple of weeks and feel really connected to that. So that's, that's really cool to hear someone else doing that work in their story because I have so many of those types of stories. Um, it's, it's a little challenging to pick. Um, I think we might have um, a map of Yosemite and that's kind of where I'd like to go. This is actually, um, and I'll come back to this slide, but uh, um, actually maybe Becky stay on this slide really quick. Um, these are a list of actually all the hotspot locations um, and almost all of our hotspots uh, that Leave No Trace conducts each year has a service component in them. Um, and I'll explain what hotspots are before we hop into uh, an example. So Leave No Trace has this hotspots program. We've had this program for um, probably over 10 years now, and we've done over 100 hotspots. Uh, hotspots change each year, and these are areas of the country that are being impacted. It can be a state park, it can be a national park, a city park, um, BLM, forest service lands, anything. Um, we do take nominations. Those nominations will actually come out. So anyone on this uh, masterclass can nominate a local park that they feel could use Leave No Trace and benefit leave from Leave No Trace and uh, grow and um, fight some of their largest impacts using the Leave No Trace knowledge and language. And so what we do is we do take in these applications, we get hundreds per year, and we only select around 10 to 12 uh, hotspot locations per year. These are each of the hotspots. Um, one of my favorites coming up is Bridger Teton next week. Um, that hotspot is actually seeing a lot of impacts from campsites, human waste impacts and litter. So we're actually gonna be up there as an example. And we're gonna be working with the local community. We're gonna be working with the forest service land management and other uh, local organizations that support that uh, land. And we're gonna start working on how to implement Leave No Trace through signage, through education, through training. Um, and we're going to leave a management plan for that, lo uh, for that location. And this happens at all the locations. They're just all completely different. Um, what we're doing in Bridger Teton is going to be different than what we're doing in Bryce Canyon, two completely different landscapes, different types of impacts. And so this is something that actually um, the Onyx campaign for this month is supporting where $10 from every product sold is going back to support the Leave No Trace hotspot. So we're Super excited to be working with Onyx on that. Um, let's zoom in on uh, Yosemite here. And I can talk a little bit about uh, the Yosemite facelift, which is something I've actually been able to partake in for the past seven years. Um, unfortunately, I don't get to go every year because that is such an amazing place to visit. Um, we work with the Yosemite Climbers Association. Um, and so this year, I believe 2022 is gonna be the 19th annual Yosemite facelift. And what that is, it's about a 2000 person wide national park, all encompassing cleanup. 
Um, so the way that the Yosemite facelift works is they'll push out through the entire year, they'll get volunteers, they'll talk about it, they'll talk about the impacts, but then for a strict four days in September around National Public Lands Day, they'll get the community to come in, they'll invite local schools, they'll invite local organizations, um, people from Mariposa County um, and just park visitors. A lot of park visitors come by. Um, we set up a entire little mini village um, out at the visitor center, which is where that red X is showing. And people are given a obviously to sign a waiver, and I can I'll go into the details of how to run a cleanup like this. Um, but they'll sign a waiver. You'll get some education. You need to learn a lot about um, the historic act and what artifacts that you should not pick up um, if found and you are given a grabber and a trash bag and asked to go out on a hike or go to a specific location if you're looking at um, really trying to get your hands dirty. Um, I know they've got a lot of sites they pinpoint to send people to um, and go out and pick trash. Um, they pick up tons of trash each year. There's construction site materials, there's micro trash, there's microplastics. I know a couple of companies also get involved. They bring in athletes and they'll clean up on the face of El Capitan and they'll climb the first several pitches with grabbers and trash bags and collect water bottles that have fallen between the cracks, wrappers from energy bars, so on and so forth. Again, this is about a four day event. Leave no traces there. We're educating people about how they can further take, uh, take action. So the cleanup is kind of one component, but how can you further, how can you better this land for the next next time you're going into Yosemite or any other national park or even your local city park um, if you're out doing any type of recreation. So we want people to leave with that ethic and etiquette, but we also want them to come back and think about what else can I do? You know, how can I further take care of wild wildlife? How can I further stay on the trail to not trample vegetation. And we want people to think in those types of mindsets. So events like this, and we do multiple different events, we partner with a ton of different um, local organizations. We have our own events as well, Leave No Trace. And so this is just one example in an amazing location that I, is close to my heart. So that's kind of why I picked this location. Uh, but I do want to talk about how to have your own cleanup. Uh, I know there's a lot of people on here trying to think about, well, how do I run my own uh, cleanup project? Maybe we can go back to that slide, Becky. And I wanted to keep it very simple because we can, we can go down rabbit holes here. Um, so the first thing I always say before I even get into creating your own cleanup, something I like to do, and Becky, you and I have talked about this for years, is carrying your own trash bag with you. You know, there's a ton of reusables, or if you do have extra plastic grocery bags lying around, I even sometimes use a pet waste bag if I don't have any other bags on me. And I pick up trash when I'm out on my hikes, or if I'm gonna go out climbing in the Flatiron Sea or in Boulder, I just pick up what I see. It's a great way to get involved without having to really do anything different than what you are normally going to do. So I really love that. Um, it, we actually just did that. Um, in Grand Teton National Park, we created mini kits for people. We boothed outside of Signal Mountain Lodge up there, and we had these little kits of gloves. Um, people could opt to take grabbers and then a uh, trash bag. And we said, hey, when you're going on your hike, will you take this? And will you go out and pick up trash? And we had an amazing amount of people come in. It was raining that day. And uh, people went out and they picked up trash, but they were still on their hike. And so it was a very low effort but it was a big impact. And that's what we like to see. So like I have here for bullet number one, go big or don't. You don't have to have a massive amount of or people at a cleanup. You don't have to have a climate rally size event. You know, you can take your family. You can, um, we saw this a lot during COVID. A lot of people went out with people they were quarantining with and picked up trash and did it in a safe manner. So you can have a large cleanup or you can make it small or you can just go out on your own. Um, if you do have a large event and you do want to get people to participate, you definitely want to get permission. There's no one to stop you to go out and go on your own hike and pick up litter along the way. It's encouraged. But if you are going to have an organized event, 
we do ask you to contact the local land management agency that you're going to be working uh, on those lands and get their permission, ask for some recommendations. They will have a great amount of resources. I work with Open Space Mountain Park here in Boulder, and they always have some new ideas, new concepts, new locations for us to conduct cleanups. So they're a wealth of resource, and I do encourage people to reach out to the local uh, community. Um, save the dates. Um, I believe, Caroline, you had mentioned this too, of creating like a Facebook event page, or you can actually register your cleanup on earthday.org and they have a great map where you can invite others to come and participate. You may not have known them and they might've just seen it on the map and said, hey, I wanna participate in this. They click on the link and then you guys can share information. So that's a, that's a great resource, earthday.org. Um, and then getting the correct supplies. So, that comes down to if you do have a budget, um, grabbers, trash bags, gloves, being able to provide those things goes a long way, but not everyone has a budget. So again, the land management that you're working with may have those supplies already and they may be willing to let you borrow them. They may even come out for the day and work side by side and answer questions about the landscape you guys are working on. So again, a great resource. Um, but I always like to go back to the air inside of safety. And so closed toed shoes, I feel like are a must. Um, sunscreen is a must and water for all participants is a must. So I like to, I like to in correspondence, tell everyone, hey, you signed up, that's fantastic. Here's what you need to know, bring some shoes. Um, I like to bring extra sunscreen in case, in case people forgot. Um, and then I like to bring like a five gallon jug of water and ask people to bring their reusable water bottles, because I think then we're obviously acting in the manner we're trying to clean up supplies. We're not going to bring, I, I really just like, it's kind of a big bugs me a little bit. Um, when we have to bring bottled water out to cleanups, because those are the kind of items that we're trying to clean up and eliminate single use plastics. So I like to eliminate that, uh, if you want to go beyond, above and beyond, um, getting some sort of reusable trash bag that you can use year over year or clean up over clean up, or even hand out, again, if you have a budget, hand out to participants um, as kind of a souvenir so they can use that again on their next hikes and kind of what I had originally spoken about. Um, document, uh, document the day, take pictures, take a lot of pictures. Um, get people to talk about it, you know, maybe even create a little hashtag, really want to create a sense of community. And that is really where we can do that. We can take the photos, we can share it with everyone. We can relive those memories. They're fun days. And so we really want our, we want our volunteers to be happy, healthy, but also enjoy what they're doing. Um, care and feed the volunteers again. Um, Everyone needs to feel safe, motivated, energized. And so just going even down to the local supermarket and getting a couple boxes of uh, energy bars can go a long way as well. Um, I like to add in leave no trace in there as well. We do this a lot when we partner with other cleanups. We add in a quick about leave no trace, sharing the seven principles of leave no trace, trying to connect people with the environment they're at. But why is this cleanup important? A lot of people we find out are at the cleanup, but don't have full knowledge of leave no trace ethics. So we want to give them those tools for the next time that they're going out on their adventure. They can lessen their impact even a little bit more. And then once they learn a little bit more, they can come back to our website, lnt.org, as a resource to even learn further and further. So again, great resources there. Um, and then sharing your accomplishments. Like I said, I saw information about the climate rally for the next couple of weeks um, after it happened and talking about it, getting people to share posts. Um, it's a really great way to feel good about the event, but then also getting people thinking about what are the next things we can do. Um, and there's a really great sense of community. You meet a lot of friends through, through social sharing as well. Awesome. Thanks, Dean. That was so much information that is really helpful and just like, here's how you do it. So I love that. I think a lot of people on this call are really looking for that um, type of tactical next step information of, of how to take it to their own community and 
We, um, we even had a few great questions that you essentially addressed, but I want to like re rehash them because um, they were awesome questions that came in about what to do. And the first one is, when do I need permission from a park or trail system to organize? Like that is a great question. And um, essentially, if you're just out there on durable surfaces, on trail, picking up trash, let it rip all day, every day. We'd love that. Do it. Um, but if you have a group or if you're looking to organize something a little bit, bigger, especially if you have, you know, maybe over like 20 people. It all depends on the piece of land though. Um, when in doubt, call and check in, figure out what rules there are, where you can and can't go, what your group size is. So um, I think the answer is when in doubt, call your local land manager. That could be a city open space, parks and rec group. That could be a national forest. Um, just dig in and, and see. And then another question in similar lines is, what are effective engagement techniques for federal public land management agencies? Also a phenomenal question. Sometimes it's hard to get through. Um, a couple tips from my side. When you're going to pitch your project or idea for collaboration, um, present yourself as best as you can. Be organized. What's your why? Who's coming with you? What are you hoping to accomplish? Um, spell it all out and make your pitch. Like That will definitely help it kind of float to the top um, and not get lost in the shuffle as much. Um, and also it can really help if you are uh, presenting your project as part of a group instead of, hi, I'm Becky, I'd like to do a cleanup with you. Um, maybe a better approach is, hi, I'm Becky, in collaboration with She Jumps, we want to come out and do these things on this parse, parse trails or whatever. Um, so being group affiliated can also really help go a long way. So hopefully those are some good tips and answers a few of our questions that are coming in. Um, okay. Moving along here, I'm going to actually stop sharing for a few so that we can dive in and see each other a little bit better here on the screen um, and dive into some fun questions that we have. Uh, let's see. I think one that also kind of ties back to some, some of the buzz that I'm hearing in the Q&A is this concept of everyone has some lever or personal capital that they can bring to their community. That might be time, that might be money, social reach, influence within a company or brand, um, whatever that is. I think every single one of us has a different, slightly different version or bundle or strength that stands out that we can bring to the table. Um, even each of the three of you, the projects you shared came from a very different place of strength, which I think is so cool. Um, so I want to em empower everyone on this call to think about what is your personal lever that you can pull? Um, really dive into that. Is it is time your best asset? Are you an influencer or an athlete and have social reach? Like, how can you really lean into that? Um, and then a question for the three of you guys on this call is, like, how did you figure out how to capitalize on the strengths you had? And was that some aha moment that, that came your way? Or was that like a slow progression over time that maybe even the, you know, your advocacy efforts and your personal lever grew together over time? Curious to dig into that. Sure, I'm happy to jump in. So uh, yeah, I'll just speak to that quickly. I think it's just like figuring out what kind of outdoor adventures you like the most. Sometimes you have to go down the wrong path and be like, okay, this isn't the best fit for me. Or sometimes you have to try something that doesn't work to find out what does work. And so it's like, you just got to get your feet wet and do something to start. Like just getting started with the first thing I think is the hardest. And once you go from there, it gets easier and easier, I think. And, um, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can incorporate advocacy or activism or giving back into what you are doing um, on a day to day. Like when I do a running race, I almost always do them as a fundraiser. And it's a really easy way to tack on a way to kind of give back to the land and for all the trails that I spent all the time training on. So it can be really simple to start. Yeah, there's a, there's a question here um, that I love so much. It's how did you first believe you are a leader and what is your personal leadership style? Um, and, and I mean, Caroline, you answered that, like, just, just, do, just start somewhere, right? Just get your feet wet, figure out what your next little step is. And maybe a lot of little ones will lead to a big one. Um, none of us were great at this at first, right? I know I, I wasn't right. It was like years of 
digging into access and stewardship and advocacy work and, and personal passions that um, eventually led to more expertise over time. And yeah, and just like with mountaineering or ski touring or something like that, you start small and you work your way up. And so it's like, I think that leadership is just something just like the skills of climbing a mountain that every time you do, it gets a little bit easier and you find more confidence. Yeah, I'd, I'll add to that. Um, I don't think any, like, um, we'll just take it in ski mountaineering senses. You have to learn how to do it, you know, and trial and error is great, but also watching and listening to others and working in other cleanup. I mean, get involved in other cleanups and then learn what they're doing correctly, what maybe they're not doing right. And then you can start building upon your own. And I think that's a, that's a great way. I mean, that's, that's honestly how I've done. I've been doing this for 12 years. I didn't know what I was doing when I started. <laughs> I started as an intern and I learned about Leave No Trace. I knew very little when I started and now I know a lot. <laughs> I'm still consistently learning. I've learned some stuff on this call and constantly adapting it and changing the things that I do based on the experience I'm gaining through through the years. Yeah, I'd like to add to that too. I think um, a big thing that I've learned over the years is like no matter how many people show up to a trail work day or support an event or or donate to a fundraiser that you're doing, like any form of support is a huge amount. And I think that as you as you learn your leadership style or your volunteer style, there are people who might resonate with it or who might not. Um, and just owning the fact that like what you're doing is important and that there will be people who will also think that's important is really something to like not get hung up on that. Like maybe not everyone will want to do exactly what you're doing but there are people who will want to do what you're doing and want to support what your efforts are. I think that's such a great point because there are so many amazing causes that we could stand for or give our time to or write a check to in, in the world, right? There's a lot to care about these days and we, we can't give our best to everyone, right? So I think oftentimes the next step is simply figuring out what do you care about the most? Maybe it's a cleanup initiative, maybe it's climate advocacy, um, there's plenty of really great things like what is your number one, what's your number two, and what's the very next step to move those things forward, I think can make can make doing things a little bit less daunting and then you know maybe you're gonna find your Caroline if like if climate, if climate topics are your jam if that's number your one or not your number two you're gonna find your like couple sources of truth latch on to them. And, and follow the path, right? Like Caroline probably had mentors for her and now she can be a mentor for you on the, on the topics that she's a, a best ad, um, uh, asset and an advocate for. So I think that can be another great like break in point. Yeah, yeah, no, Dina and Kristen, I really liked your points. And I think like seeking out the training too can be really helpful. Like I did a citizen lobby training with a local grassroots nonprofit. And like, I've gone to a lot of trainings and I'm always trying to keep learning and growing. And so there are a lot of places where you can go to get these tools as well. And then the mentorship component or having someone to learn from, you know, like I'm always calling people up, whether it's about mountaineering or about activism to try to get feedback, advice, ideas, collaborations. And so continuing to manage those relationships and to find new ones. Like that's a really fun part of it, honestly. Yeah, I agree. Um, I also think it's interesting that like, if you have a really good idea and you have a good way to communicate your idea, like people will support it and they'll say yes. And that's something I've learned over the years is if you want to make something happen and you know the people who can help make it happen, like talk to those people and ask them for permission or ask them for their support. And you'd be really surprised at how many people are like, wow, like I want to support this. I'll make it happen. And maybe they have more resources than you have in the immediate moment to make it happen. And it will all come together. I love that. Such a good point. And, and also, um, yeah, like how do you rally people that want to support you? And then also how do you get them to care too, right? I think there's oftentimes a forgotten 
emotional part to that as well. Like how do you really pull on the heartstrings of others to, to, to um, get them to, to join you? So I think that's an important part to think about also. Um, okay, we're gonna we're gonna move along because it's already 6:59 and we have some slides to get through here. Uh, but this has been super really fun and rich uh, conversation so far. I wish we could go on all night, but let's do our giveaway. This is the big win fun stuff. So Icon Pass is a sponsor of both Caroline and Kristen, um, and we are all fortunate enough to be here for a chance to win one. Um, you do not need to be a you know don't, don't need to purchase on X Backcountry. Uh, to enter to win, but you do need an account. So you can put in your name and email, get signed up for an, a, a free trial, um, and then enter to win via link in chat and or uh, QR code here. So that is super exciting. Thank you to Icon Pass. Um, Q&A, we did our best to sneak in a few of these already. So we're gonna keep on going. Um, we wanted to share with you guys some actual tools that you can leave this call with to take with you on your next steps. So a few things that we wanted to, to drop links in the chat for. The first one is this great little video that Leave No Trace produced about how to run your own cleanup. Give that a watch. It's an awesome starting point with some tips and tricks. Um, then if you want to join a local She Jumps event, there are lots of them out there all across uh, the country. So um, th the event link is here. Tune in, see what's near you and, and get going with She Jumps. And then um, I want to share with you this really cool resource that our friends at Onyx Off-Road produced earlier this year. This is an actual planning guide for cleanups resource, and this very much mimics what Dean already shared. But you can, this is a digital, this is a PDF that you can download off our website. It's literally step-by-step -step what to do, how to plan. Um, it's super cool, right? So anything from like, okay, choose your date and location. Who are you going to invite? invite? How are you going to manage risk? Do I need a waiver? Uh, what supplies should I bring here? Can I get my dump fees covered but or sponsored? Um, so this is amazing. I would highly encourage you guys to save this link, print this out, whatever you want to do. You can like write on it. It's an awesome planning tool. So we have that for you as well. This was built for the motorized consumer in partnership with the public land stewards of Bend, with, which is this awesome uh, motorized group of folks up in Oregon that do massive cleanups, but works for all multi-use human powered trails as well. So uh, some great things for you to take away. And then if you aren't familiar with our Explore and um, Restore grant, it's part of our Great Outdoors Month Give Back initiatives that we have. Um, so again, just a plug that you can get a discount at a disc, you can get a membership at a discount and 10 bucks goes back to leave no trace. And then we also, as Onyx Backcountry, have $10,000 set aside to give to your favorite trail organizations. We have four grants each at 2,500 bucks. Um, you can enter to win essentially by sharing through social media what your favorite trail and trail org is. Um, you can learn all about the details of how to register through the link in QR code, but it's pretty simple. Essentially, we want you to tell us the trails that are worth celebrating, uh, your favorites, and we'll give out these four grants. So that goes through June. We'd love for you to check that out and um, share with us your best. And then just a couple last little um, notes here. Uh, the Onyx product is, it's so cool and there's so much in it and it's really technical and what an incredible tool it is. But we also know, especially as you're getting started, despite it being really user-friendly and intuitive, you might have questions, you might need tutorials, um, you might need blogs to read or YouTube demos to check out. Um, so we have all of that. So as you're really building your own confidence in the app and planning more objective-based routes and adventures along the way, um, tune in to all of these resources that the team here has built to really help you learn more. Um, if you have any questions about, uh, personal questions about your account or about the app, reach out to our incredible customer service team. They like always blow me away every single day with how fast they are, how good they are. So use them. They'd love to hear from you. Um, they're a really rock star team of customer service folks. So use that if you need. Um, and then again, let us know what other master classes you want us to, uh, to run in the future. Who should we have on here? What topics do you want to explore with us? All that good stuff. 
Um, so I know we're just a few minutes over time, but I'd love to give each one of our three incredible get, uh, guests just one more minute parting thoughts. I, we could talk about this all night, but um, one minute of parting thoughts or last, last things to share from each of you, and then we will wrap it up and close her out. So who wants to go first? Dean, you're up. Okay. Um... Well, first of all, thank you, everyone. Thanks to all the panelists for joining. Um, I definitely, like I said, I, I truly did learn learn some things um, hearing all the different types of case studies out there, things I wasn't necessarily familiar with. Um, so I really appreciate it. Um, we are a resource, Leave No Trace is a resource, lnt.org. You can find out all the information you need about all the stuff we spoke about, other ways you can take action, uh, protect our landscapes, get involved. It's all on the website. Um, pretty easy to navigate through that. Um, and then also we're always sharing um, tips and tricks on our social media account. So um, leave no trace org on, I think all of our accounts. Um, so do give a follow, uh, great inspirational, um, get outdoor um, ways to protect, explore and restore. So thank you so much. Appreciate you guys having me. I guess I'll go next. Um, first of all, it's an honor to be on this panel and speak with all of you folks. Um, it's been really cool to be a part of. And um, as a She Jumps volunteer, I think a big thing that I've learned over the years and have seen people like be afraid of is because it's volunteer work, you feel like committed to doing something even though you might not have the time. And I think a big thing to remember is that it is volunteer work at the end of the day. And if you have only so much time to give, then don't be afraid to give that time, but also protect your time too, because um, if, if you're turning it into work and it's not fun, then it's something where it's going to become harder and harder to do. Um, so just remember that volunteer work is awesome work and any time that you can give is appreciated, but like we all have lives too. So don't, don't forget to protect your life and your own personal interests too. Um, but I think all of these things are really cool and just make sure that, um, that you take care of yourself and then are also trying to find ways that you can actually activate your community and, and give back to them too. Thanks. That's some great advice, Kristen. Um, when I first started, um, sharing with people about my dreams of climbing and skiing the biggest mountains. A lot of people told me that I was like too small or too delicate or that my dreams were impossible. And I feel like sometimes I get that same sort of feedback when I talk about these dreams for massive climate action or for allocating a lot more funding to protect wild places. And um, I would just say that we can't let other people dictate what our dreams are or how big we can go. Like we have to really believe in ourselves. And I know that we all have much deeper reserves than we think. And so when it comes to taking action, like set goals and dream big and pace yourself so you don't get burnt out, like that self-care piece is crucial, but there's a way to make it a part of your life. And um one of my favorite resources for getting started is Patagonia Action Works. If I'm going to share the link, they have a tool where you can find local grassroots nonprofits near you. And so just, just maybe find one, sign up for their email list, like have that be your first action. And don't ever doubt the power of a committed group of people who have big dreams and goals because we can make a lot happen. You are all amazing. I truly wish we were sitting around a campfire and we could just go down rabbit hole after rabbit hole of all these topics. It's so cool. Um, thank you all for your time and your expertise. I know I learned a lot of things during this call. Um, Dean, you said you did too. I th this is just the journey of learning these things and just figuring out how to use the levers we have, build our own expertise and and take take the actions that we can and mobilize um, a little bit more and more over time. So appreciate you all so much for the work you're doing, the time tonight. You are all inspirations for us and I'm sure everyone on this call. Um, so thanks for being here. Stay safe out there. Happy adventuring and we'll check y'all soon. Thank you so much. Bye.